Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's House Tops. This is a program where we seek to fulfill God's command to preach and proclaim upon the housetops what we hear in the ear. As we read in Matthew 10, verse 27, What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. Tonight on Housetops, our speaker is Bobby Seabee from Woodcliff Lake, New Jersey. Okay, so what we're going to be looking at this morning is Proverbs 11, verse 4. And the name of the study we'll call it is Riches Profit Not in the Day of Wrath. And in Proverbs 11, verse 4, it says, Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from death. And this verse, I thought it would be good to look at. We get a little extra insight now that we're living in the day of judgment. Since we've been living in the day of judgment, we can learn a little bit more about this verse. And for me, about 10 years ago, I had been doing some work and I was out and at some very expensive homes. And I was on a lunch break and I had the Bible on my phone. And I was just going through the Proverbs because they're short and you can just quickly read them. And I read this verse, and it was like 2013, and, it's, and I, it just really stood out for me. I felt like God was speaking to me directly. Sometimes, you know, there's a verse that really just kind of strikes us. And so, but in any event, I did thought it would be a good verse to look at today. So let's start off looking at the day of wrath. Um, that phrase we find in a few places in the Bible. You know, as the Lord Jesus has multiple names, you know, how he's called faithful and true and the prince of peace and the everlasting father. The day of judgment has a few different names as well. Sometimes it's called the day of the Lord or the day of Jehovah, the day of calamity, the day of evil. It has several names like that. And as we got, we get different, we learn more about the Lord Jesus and his characteristics. We learn a little bit more about the day of judgment as well. And as we know, as the day of wrath, it's the day of Lord's wrath right now. And God is pouring out his wrath on the, the inhabitants of the world. And we're seeing this happen before our eyes. So let's look at the first time we find this phrase, day of wrath. We're going to turn to Job 21 and go to verse 30. Job 21, verse 30, it says, That the wicked is reserved to the day of destruction. They shall be brought forth to the day of wrath. And if we read a verse like this, we should see right away that this is Hebrew parallelism, where the first part of the verse is saying the same thing as the second part. So we see the day of wrath there, and we also see the day of destruction. So we can see those are parallel. So the day of wrath is also a day of destruction. And we know, you know, Chris was talking yesterday about the unawares destruction that's occurring right now. And the people of the world don't see it. So it, while it's a spiritual judgment, we also know that there's a physical outworking of it, which we're seeing, but the people of the world do not see it. So it's an unawares destruction. Uh, another place we can find the day of wrath is in Zephaniah 1. And we'll turn to Zephaniah 1. This is a chapter dealing with Judgment Day. Zephaniah chapter 1. And in verse 15, it says, That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. And then in verse 16, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fence cities and against the high towers. So when we read this here, we're seeing uh, all these things today. We, we're seeing this. We're seeing trouble, distress, wasteness, desolation, darkness, all of these things are in evidence. So remember when Mr. Camping went through the book of Jeremiah, and he would say, you know, as it chronicles the destruction of Judah, the judgment there, and how that was pointing to the judgment on the church, um, he would say, well, this is like reading today's newspaper. Well, when we read Zephaniah 115, that is almost like reading today's newspaper as well, because we're seeing all of this. The world is being troubled in a very severe way. Uh, and we know it's not a random thing at all, but it's completely the will of God. 
Um, we also find the day of wrath, the phrase in the New Testament, a couple of verses we've, we're not going to turn there, but we're aware of them, like in Romans 2, 5, the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Uh, it's a blessing to know that we are living in the day of wrath, but it's also a day of revelation as God has opened up his word and we're learning more and more from it. And then also in Revelation 6, 17, where it says the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? And we know by God's grace, the elect will be able to stand. So moving on now, we're going to consider the next part of Proverbs 11, verse 4. We're going to look at riches. And the Bible has a lot to say about riches. We're not going to cover all of it. We're just going to look at some parts of it because there is quite a bit. But this word here in Proverbs 11, verse 4, this word riches is Strong's uh, 1952 in the Hebrew. And um, it's translated as riches, substance, and wealth. Now, there are good riches in the Bible. Um, there are riches like the, the spiritual riches of the kingdom of God and salvation and the gospel. But when we read Proverbs 11, verse 4, we know that riches profit not, these can't be the good, durable riches that we read about that Christ mentions and when he speaks in Proverbs 8 about the durable riches. It's not that. It's, 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 there's riches that are not good. Uh, let's turn to Proverbs 13, and we'll read verse 11. Okay, Proverbs 13, verse 11, and it's, we'll find the word riches here is translated as wealth. So it says, it says their wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. And this word, if you look at that word, shall be diminished, in one place it's translated as brought to nothing. And so wealth gotten by vanity shall be brought to nothing. So when we look at the physical riches of this world, we know that they're going to be brought to nothing. And if you remember, Chris has used the analogy of, of the sandcastle uh, at the beach and you know, like say some kids built a sandcastle, then the tide comes in and it washes it all away. And that really is what uh, the physical riches of the world are gonna, is going to happen to them. So we look at it and say, well, why is it that riches aren't profitable in the day of judgment and our day now? Uh, this goes completely against the, what the world would think. I mean, the world thinks riches are, you know, one of the most important things. Uh, riches are almost everything to the, to the people of the world. Uh, the problem with them is that they cannot redeem your soul. And the Bible makes some emphasis on this. Let's look at a few places. Guy was just reading from Psalm 49, and that's where we're going to start. Uh, Psalm 49, and we're going to start reading in verse 4. And it says there, I will incline mine ear to a parable. I will open my dark saying upon the harp. Wherefore should I fear in the days of evil when the iniquity of my heels shall compass me about? And so God starts off speaking about parables. We know that word can also be translated as proverbs. And then he starts talking about the days of evil. And we know that's right now. And now let's continue with verse 6 of Psalm 49, where it says, They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches... None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him, for the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceaseth forever. So there's an emphasis here that riches cannot redeem. Redemption is a precious thing. It's something that only Christ can do, and he bought his people with a price. Uh, the next passage we're going to look at is Ezekiel 7. And here, we're going to read something similar, but instead of talking about wealth or riches, God is going to use silver and gold. And then instead of redeem, we're going to see deliver. Both of those words have to do with salvation. Let's read Ezekiel 7, and then verse 19. They shall cast their silver in the streets, and their gold shall be removed. Their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of Jehovah. They shall not satisfy their souls, neither fill their bowels, because it is the stumbling block of their iniquity. 
And that word satisfy there, they shall not satisfy their souls, that has to do with salvation. We don't have to turn there, but if you might recall the last verse of Psalm 91, I'll just read it really quick, where it says, With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. So in Ezekiel 7, the people are bringing forth gold and silver, and they shall not be delivered because there is no more salvation. They shall not satisfy their souls. Uh, and then the third passage we're going to look at is, and just really quickly, uh, we're going to turn back to Zephaniah 1. And we're going to find something similar there that we just read in Ezekiel chapter 7. So Zephaniah 1, and we're going to read verse 18. Zephaniah 1.18, neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of Jehovah's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. And so we we're reminded of the fact that only Christ could have redeemed while it was the day of salvation. Um, We'll just read one verse to just emphasize this. We'll turn back again to Psalm 49. And we'll read there in verse 15. Psalm 49, 15. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me, Selah. So this is something that God is going to do. He's going to redeem. We are not. Um, sadly, some people really thought that you could be redeemed by money. Uh, can anyone think of someone in the Bible who tried to offer money to get right with God? Oh, you guys are good. Very good. Um, yep, that's it. It's Simon the Sorcerer. And only when you guys were reading uh, uh, Baptism, the washing away of our sins, and I came across that when we were reading that for the panel discussion, and I said, oh, look at this. This is perfect. Uh, Acts 8, verse 20. I'm just going to read verse 20 of Acts 8. Um, this is where Simon is trying to make it off. He offered money. And in verse 20 of Acts 8, Peter says to Simon the sorcerer, thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. And what is the gift of God? That's salvation. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And another, and Chris, Chris talked about the Catholic Church yesterday with purgatory. You know, there were people that thought that people could be freed by, uh, if people bought these indulgences, so that people died and they went to this fictional place called purgatory. And then if you paid enough money, you could redeem them. And it just once again shows you the fallacy of a gospel based upon works. That once you start that works-based gospel, uh, you just if, that, if that's your foundation, you just keep building on incorrect doctrine after incorrect doctrine. Um, and the Bible makes it clear we were not redeemed by corruptible things, but by the blood or the life of Christ. Let's turn to 1 Peter 1, and we'll just read that. 1 Peter chapter 1, and in verse, we'll read verses 18 and 19, where it says there, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So now let's look at this idea about riches. Can they, can they relate to works? You know, when we look at gold and silver, normally we think of the elect true believers. When like we read like in Ze Zechariah 13 or in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we think about the elect. But what if there's something else here? And let's look at some verses that relate gold and silver to idols. Um, we're going to start in Psalm 115, and we'll read a couple of verses here. Psalm 115, and we'll read verses 4 and 5. And this is speaking about the heathen here. 
uh, Psalm 115, verse 4, their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. And it continues from there. So we see in this verse, idols are the work of men's hands. Let's now go over to Isaiah chapter 2, and we're going to see some more of this. There's some Judgment Day verses in this chapter. Isaiah 2, we'll, read, we'll start reading in verse 7. Isaiah 2, 7 says, Their land also is full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. Their land also is full of idols, they worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. Uh, so we see it there, the work of their own hands. And let's skip down to verse 20 of Isaiah 2. And it says there, In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they have made, each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats, to go into the clefts of the rocks, and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of Jehovah and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake it terribly the earth. And casting away idols of silver and gold, that happens in Judgment Day. Um, we can move, skip ahead a little bit to Isaiah 31, and we'll, we'll look at verse 7. Isaiah 31, verse 7 says, for in that day every man shall cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which your own hands have made unto you for a sin. And we know that the day of judgment is the day when God destroys the idols of the world. We won't turn there, but if we went back to Isaiah 2, verse 18, we'll read there, and the idols he shall utterly abolish. And that's speaking of God doing that. Um, Another place where we see this, if we go back to Exodus 20, uh, God commands the Israelites not to make idols. And he's, he lays it out very clearly here in Exodus 20 and in verse 23. It says there that ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. And we know not long after this, the Israelites disobeyed this command, and they did it anyway. They ended up going to Aaron, and they make this golden calf. And in Exodus 32, we read in verse 31, where it says that Moses returned unto Jehovah, and he said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. So when we read these verses that we did in Isaiah 2 and in Exodus, God is linking idols of gold and silver with works, specifically with regards to the construction of these idols. So when we're reading in Zephaniah 118 about neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of Jehovah's wrath, it's not so much that the people of the world are coming forth with gold and silver and trying to save themselves. But what we're seeing is the focus is on idolatry, on false gospels, which are the works of men, in a vain effort to try to save themselves with a do-it-yourself salvation plan. And we're aware that, you know, our own righteousness is, you know, is called filthy rags. And we know that our individual works shall not profit at all. Uh, God declares this. We can turn to Isaiah 57. And Isaiah 57, we'll read uh, verses 11 and 12. And God declares here, And of whom hast thou been afraid or feared, that thou hast lied, and hast not remembered me, nor laid it to thy heart? Have not I held my peace even of old, and thou fearest me not? And then here's the key verse here. I, I will declare thy righteousness and thy works, for they shall not profit thee. 
And then we'll turn over to Matthew 7. This is familiar to us, but it really emphasizes the point here about the works. If we read Matthew 7, and we'll read verses 21 through 24, and Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So people are coming forth uh, in the day of judgment saying they've done many wonderful works in the name of Christ, and all these things which they claim to have done, whatever it may be, if they think it's their own faith, if they think it's some kind of work that they've done, that they've been obedient in some way, we know that these cannot redeem anyone. Only Christ could, could have saved while it was still the day of salvation. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the word prophet in Proverbs 11, verse 4. We're going to look at the word prophet. It's Strong's 3276 in the Hebrew. Um, one place we can learn a little bit about it, another place, it's, another place it's found where it's translated, is in Job 15. And we'll read verses 1 through 3. We're going to find that it's translated as do, it's do no good. Um, so we'll read Job 15, verse 1, where it says, Then answered Eliphaz the Temanite and said, Should a wise man utter vain knowledge and fill his belly with the east wind, should he reason with unprofitable talk or with speeches wherewith he can do no good? So in verse 3 there of Job 15, it says he can do no good. That's like profit not. So riches do no good in the day of wrath. Uh, another verse we can look at is in 1 Samuel 12. We'll find this word here, this word profit. Uh, 1 Samuel 12, and we will read verses 20 and 21. 1 Samuel 12, 20, And Samuel said unto the people, Fear not, ye have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following Jehovah, but serve Jehovah with all your heart. And turn ye not aside, for then should ye go after vain things, which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. And it's the word profit there. And the word deliver, uh, as mentioned earlier, has to do with salvation. We'll consider that a little bit more when we consider the rest of Proverbs 11, verse 4, where it says that righteousness delivereth from death. Um, and also we can think about, another verse we can think about is in Matthew 16, um, about regarding profiting. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, in verse 26, and this is a familiar verse, uh, Matthew 16, 26, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And we read that, and it, actually it's interesting, if you read verse 27, it speaks about the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father. It's, it's in the context of, of the coming of Christ. Um, the word uh, translated as soul in Matthew 16, 26 is often translated as life. So losing your own soul is like losing your life. And then, we, and then it asks, well, what shall a man give in exchange for his life? Can he give gold and silver? Can he offer his good works for salvation? We know the answer to that is no. That cannot happen. If we look at, there's a parallel verse to this in Luke 9. And it's interesting with the new when the, in the gospel accounts when these verses get seemingly repeated, but sometimes God will use a different word. If you look the words up, sometimes it's slightly different, and a different Greek word might be used. It might even be the same English word, and it gives you just a little extra insight into the verse. So let's consider Luke nine twenty five. 
And in that verse, which is parallel to Matthew 16, 26, it says, for what is a man advantaged, and that word advantage is the same as the word profited in Matthew, for what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? And that word lose is different here. It's, it's also found as destroy. So what if, what is a man advantaged or profited if he gain the whole world and destroy himself? And that's what we're looking at today. Those who are rich seeking after their own pleasure, those who are rich in their works or rich in their own wisdom, uh, they're going to destroy themselves. There's no profit at all in these riches. There's no eternal life. Profit has to do with salvation. We can see this in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, and we'll read verse 2. It says there, For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So again, riches profit not, they do not bring salvation. God gives us a very clear example of this in Luke 12. If you remember, there was a rich man that prospered, and he pulled down his barns and built greater ones, and then thought he could take his ease. And in Luke 12, we're not going to read the whole parable, but if we just start in verse 20, where God comes to him, and he says to this rich man, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be? which thou hast provided, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So we look at this and we say, well, did riches profit this man? And the answer is no. Where it says in verse 20 of Luke 12, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Interesting, because Christ comes as a thief in the night. He also is in John 9, that when the night cometh and no man can work. And then in also in Daniel 5, where we read about Belshazzar, he was slain in that night. That was pointing to the end of the Great Tribulation. So we're looking at this and we can see judgment in view. When judgment, when Christ comes and in, in, when he came in Judgment Day, he took away the light of the gospel and the possibility of salvation. And this can make us think of a verse in Jeremiah 51 that I'd like to read. In Jeremiah 51, verse 13, and it says there that, speaking about Babylon, which we know is a picture of the world in Judgment Day, Jeremiah 51, 13, O thou that dwellest upon many waters, abundant in treasures, Thine end is come, and the measure of thy covetousness. Okay, so now I'd like to move on to the second part of Proverbs 11, verse 4, which is righteousness delivereth from death. And it's interesting, the word righteousness, we're pretty well trained at this point when we see that. We know that it's pointing to Christ, uh, based on 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. You don't have to turn there. I'll just read it really quick. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Uh, another verse we can read is Matthew 5. And we'll read verse 20, speaking about righteousness. And it's interesting um, I did look at some commentators had to say about Proverbs 11, verse 4, and um, some of the older ones, not anything current. And interesting, they do not notice that righteousness is Christ. Uh, they don't see that at all. And um, it just shows you that, like Mr. Camping used to say, it's not that we're so smart that we see these things. We're just living at the time where God has opened up his word. But in Matthew 5, 20... It says there where Jesus declares, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, 
ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And interestingly, for the child of God, his righteousness does exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees because he has Christ as his righteousness, uh, and the Pharisees do not. So um, now let's look at the word delivereth in Proverbs 11, verse 4. Um, that's Strong's 5337, and we can see a connection between deliver and salvation. We'll read a couple of verses to show this. Uh, let's first go to Psalm 71, and we'll read verse 2. Okay, Psalm 71, verse 2 says, Deliver me in thy righteousness, and cause me to escape. Incline thine ear unto me, and save me. So we see this, deliver, we also see save, we also see the word escape, and we might remember there's some verses in the New Testament where we read about escape, and that's pointing to salvation. Let's also look at another place with deliver, uh, delivereth, and that we find in Proverbs 11.4, and that's in Jeremiah 15. Jeremiah 15, and we will read verses 20 and 21, the last two verses of the chapter. Jeremiah 15, 20 says, And I will make thee unto this people a fenced brazen wall, and they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee to save thee, and to deliver thee, saith Jehovah, and I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked, and I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. So we look at the deeper spiritual meaning of, of this, and we say righteous delivereth from death, and we can see that this is pointing to Christ being the Savior and saving his people. And with regards to death, we know that that, you know, delivering from death is what salvation is. Another thing to think about is since May 21st, 2011, the world has been in the dark spiritual condition of hell or the grave or death. And so when we read, it's like a parallel. When we read about riches profiting not in the day of wrath, and then we read about righteousness delivering from death, we can see those things are linked. Because in the day of wrath, the world is in this condition of hell or death. And we know that God's people will be delivered from death, and we will be delivered from this current condition we find ourselves in. And what I think about from time to time is what Ron Exum used to say, leading up to some of the end time dates, where he used to say, we're getting out of here. And um, only Ron, I think, could have done that, but those of you that remember Ron. Um, but as we look out at the world today, um, we see it's becoming more and more uncomfortable. But it's a comfort to know that this is a light affliction. It's but for a moment. We won't always be here. So as we look at, you know, like Lot, who was in Sodom, and his soul was vexed day by day, and... We see that with us, and we see the division, the turmoil, and the disasters everywhere, and of course the sin which does so easily beset us. And we see all the pandemics and transgender issues and wars, and it's really a blessing to think about that, that we will be getting out of here, that this current indignation is going to be overpassed. It's temporary, and it has an end. And the world has this expression about being on a collision course with history. And it gets used sometimes with regards to world affairs when people see like a disaster looming, or maybe like there's two countries that look like they're on a collision course, there could be a war. Some people think we're on a collision course with the environment, that, that there's going to be some future disaster coming. But the real collision course the world is on is with the biblical calendar of history. And we collided very specifically in 1988 when the church age ended. And this was a disaster for the churches. And then in 2011, when Judgment Day began, 
This was a disaster for the people of the world. And we don't think about it so much, but it is. And, and the world is in a state of being in a prison, as we read about in Revelation 18.2. And those who are righteous will remain righteous. Those who are filthy will remain filthy. And there's no translation. There's no getting out of here. It's finished. It's just like when the door of the ark was shut and the 40 days and 40 nights of rain. That's the spot we're in. And right now, we look and we see that according to the biblical evidence, the world is very clearly on a collision course with the year 2033. And may it be that God will bring an end of all things and that it's his will to deliver the great multitude out of this condition of hell and to be with him forevermore in the glorious eternity future that awaits. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this opportunity to go through thy word, and we thank thee, Father, for the scriptures and all of the understanding that thou hast blessed us with. We thank thee, Lord, for this time, for this conference. May it be that thy blessing would be on the rest of the teaching, and from Chris and from Robert and from Eddie, from Guy, may it be, Lord, that thou would bless the fellowship this weekend. And may it be, Lord, that thou would help us to understand that riches profit not in this day and that soon thou will be coming to, to end all things. Thanks for being with us for eBible Fellowship's House Tops. We hope you enjoyed our program and remember Luke 12, 3, which tells us, Therefore whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops.